Hi everyone and Happy New Year. I'm Cypher and I'm finally back with ESP32 version 2. This has easily become your favorite project out of everything I've made. I get messages about Div every single day. And now it's finally here. After version 1 I released a few firmware updates but I never really had a chance to make a full video about all the new features. You guys already knew about the hardware redesign. So in this video I show you everything that's new and wrap up the full hardware update. First of all, just like most of my projects, this one is also completely open source. You can find the full documentation, source code and PCB files on my GitHub. And if you like to support my work and help me creating projects like this, you can join my Patreon. It really means a lot. The esp 32 d user interface is organized into a few top level categories Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, 2.4 GHz, sub GHz, tools and settings Overall we have a lot of features but for now I only talk about what's new and what changed Packet monitor is your Wi-Fi listen only tool The ESP32 radio is placed into promiscuous mode which means it can hear any Wi-Fi frames on the current channel not just traffic address to itself you can manually change the channel from the UI and the framework continuously listen and visualize activity. This version also supports pickup logging to the SD card, so captures can be opened later in Wireshark. To keep the interface responsive, frame aren't written in the SD card inside the receive callback. Instead, they're buffered in memory and written safely from the main loop. Wi-Fi DSR targets the control layer of Wi-Fi, not encryption. It exploits the fact that older networks trusted unauthenticated management frames. That's exactly why modern protections like 802.11w exist, to shut this entire class of attack down. I originally included this feature in ESPD to support the evil portal workflow, but then I thought why not make it available as a standalone tool as well. So here it is. Captive Portal turns the ESP32 div into a tiny access point, DNS server, and web server. When a device connects, most operating systems automatically open a login page similar to hotel or airport Wi-Fi. When a device connects, the OS automatically checks for internet access. The ESP32 answers locally, forcing the familiar signing to network page to appear. I added the ability to create your own access point or clone an existing one nearby. If you clone a network, it first sends a DS packet to disconnect clients from the original AP, and the rest is exactly what you expect. The portal is hosted entirely on the device, and submitted entries are stored locally, and can be exported on the SD card. This feature doesn't touch encryption. It works before HTTPS, before authentication, the exact moment a device decides who to trust. BLE sniffer continuously scans for nearby Bluetooth low energy advertisements. Devices are tracked by MAC address, signal strength, packet count, and last seen time. The firmware also applies simple heuristics, unusually high packet rates, strong RSSI or repeating patterns, and visually highlight suspicious entries. In BLE Rubber Ducky feature, the device advertises itself as a BLE keyboard, and once the target connects, it starts sending keystrokes automatically. Scripts are loaded directly from the SD card, the framework scans a Ducky folder and supports a standard script file, along with metadata like name and description that's shown in the UI. The execution engine parses delay, strings, and key combination then sends proper HID reports over BLE. When you exit the feature, the framework sends an all-key release report and stop advertising completely, so the device doesn't stay visible or paired by accident. Replay attack in this framework is built around a sub radio and a signal decode and transmit library. The whole point is to demonstrate a simple security reality. Some legacy R remotes are replayable, while secure ones use rolling codes and don't give a 
about replay. The device tunes to selected subgar's frequency and listens for decodable transmissions. When a signal is detected, it captures and displays the core parameters, frequency, values, protocol, and bit length. I also added a auto scan mode. It hops through a frequency list and temporarily locks when activity is detected, which makes finding live signal way faster. Saved profile is what makes sub gigahertz feature usable. Captured signal are stored as profiles with frequency, values, protocol, and a human readable name. The framework keeps a small number internally and then uses the SD card for large archives, so you can browse everything later. The UI for save profile looks much better now. We have list view, selection highlight, detail panel, plus actions like transmit and delete. With confirmation so you don't wipe profiles by accident. This video is sponsored by NextPCB. If you're working on a custom hardware project, NextPCB is a solid choice for PCB manufacturing. They offer high quality boards, fast production times, and support for everything from simple prototype to advanced multi-layer designs. Check them out through the link in the description and thanks for the next PCB for supporting the channel. Before moving on to the rest of the features, let's take a quick look at the hardware. About the hardware, I already explained most of it in detail in the last two videos, so here I focus only on the final changes. First of all, I switched the buttons to these soft tactile switches. After RF Clown and Summify, honestly I just couldn't resist using them again. I also added a buzzer to make things a bit more interesting, because why not? It shares a GPIO with a voltage divider to measure the battery percentage, so using the buzzer is completely optional. The most important change is the move to the ESP32-S3. Thanks to this, many of the pin conflict from the last version are gone, and we also get some new capabilities as well. For the battery charging, which I struggled with before, I finally settled on IP5306. It includes a boost converter and from my test, everything works correctly. The only issue I'm still facing is the I2C interface of this chip. It's supposed to give us useful battery information but right now, it doesn't seem to be working. Then we have other components. An SD card reader which is constantly used in this firmware, a CP2102 for uploading firmware, and instead of one large NeoPixel, I'm now using four small WS2812 NeoPixels. And now let's talk about the shield. My main goal was to make the main board stable and reliable. So from this point on, we can fully focus on the shield, adding new features and supporting more protocols. Just like before, shield includes three NRF24 modules, a CC1101, several antennas and finally infrared. Of course, I managed to pick the wrong IR receiver at first, so I built a DIY one to test the code and I've shared the fixed version on my GitHub, so you don't have to deal with the same issue. One thing that really makes this version special is the Pogo pin headers. If you look closely, you'll notice how thin ESP32DV is now. And that's all thanks to these spring-loaded pin connectors. Now let's switch to the IR menu. First feature lets you capture a real IR remote button press. Visualize the signal, replay it, and optionally save it to the SD card. The ESP32 listens with an IR receiver, decodes the signal if possible, and also records the raw timing data, so it can replay almost any remote, even if decoding isn't perfect. You can adjust how many times the signal is sent, transmit it, save it to the SD card, or enable auto-repeat for testing. Next is IR save profile. Each profile includes the original signal data, so it can be replayed accurately at the correct carrier frequency. I already tested the BLE jammer and protocol in the ESP32D version 1 video. You can check that if you want to see them in action.
But because of the hardware changes in the version 2, we don't have the same power issue or pin conflict anymore. So these features work much better now. Just don't confuse these with my other project, RF Clown. Yes, the process and logic are similar, but RF Clown was designed for one single purpose. And because of that, it's still better in that specific role. The 2.4 GHz scanner also works much better now. This is one of the most useful and let's say non-destructive tools we have in the ESP32 Deep. Instead of decoding packets, it measures energy activity across the 2.4 GHz band. The framework simply scans each channel and displays the activities on a spectrum style graph. In this update, we also have a setting page. Setting is a single page menu but it affects almost every feature. You can adjust brightness, UI theme, no pixel behavior, and background scanning. All settings are saved as a small JSON file on the SD card, so preferences persist across reboots. In tools menu, for now we got serial monitor which shows live USB logs for debugging, firmware update which launches the update workflow, with one rule never interrupt power. In firmware update, you got two options, updating from SD card or using OTA. The device hosts an update interface and writes the new firmware directly to the flash. And most important one, touch calibration, which handles screen accuracy. The firmware collects raw touch data from the four corners of the display, calculates the calibration values and saves them to the persistence storage. As I said before, these were just a few of the features I wanted to highlight, either because they are new or because they've changed significantly. esp 32 Deep is my favorite project so far and I'm not done with it. There are more features coming, bugs to fix and always room for improvement. And this project is going to keep evolving.